This morning's first panel is on African American cool, commodification, erasure, and appropriation. So, appropriation, here we go. Um, our moderator today is Lucius T. Outlaw Jr., professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt. And for those of you who were not here last night, you missed your blessing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Outlaw. Um, we, we talked a long time after the session last night, just in uh, various groups about your words, so thank you. Our panelists are David Livington Smith, Professor of Philosophy at University of New England. And then we have Phil Cunningham coming, from us, coming to us from Quinnipiac. I had to figure out how to say that, uh, college in Connecticut. Um, Nikisha Head, we hope, is on her way. Um, but if not, we'll have uh, more time for Q&A with our two panelists and our moderators. And with that, I'll turn it over to our panel. Thank you. Let me just say a couple of things. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah. yeah. Being an old black man, spent more time in Baptist church than I ever need to in the rest of my life. I think I can project it. Y'all got to stop laughing so much. Our two panelists, let me just urge, ask of you, if you haven't done so already, Please turn to the biographies that are in here to read about our presenters and all of them. That's what you get. Is there a few people who can't hear? I can't. You don't smell I guess I should have kept going to the Baptist church. <laughs> uh, let me just ask that you turn to the bio section of the biographies in the program booklet, and then you can get full information about each of our panelists and all of the people who are participating in the conference uh, this weekend. Uh, each person is going to present roughly about 20 minutes or so, and we will then take questions and answers, engagements and comments and stuff after each of their presentations. So as each is presenting, please make a note of issues or questions or comments you wish to make or questions you wish to pose so that when we get to that section, we can then take that up. And we've got about an hour and a half. We want to try to stay within that time frame, though I'm the last person on earth to insist about that. Uh, but first we'll have with Brother DLS, David Livingston Smith, and then Brother PC, Brother Philip Cunningham, in that order. David, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if, if I just try to just turn this around. Read even though it's on the, the screen. You can all hear me okay? Okay, so this is kind of a maybe a depressing way to start this conference. Uh, I do work on dehumanization. And last week, when, when Jerry Ann asked if I would fill in for someone who couldn't make it, and I read the theme of the conference, I thought, oh my God, what, what am I going to talk about? I, I don't talk about nice things, I don't write about nice things. I write about awful things. I write about the Holocaust and spectacle lynchings and the genocides ongoing as, as I speak. I do that kind of stuff. Uh, but then it occurred to me I could do I could do that. I could do the negative aesthetic. I could do the opposite of adornment. I could talk about the brutalities that black people have been subjected to in this country, and unfortunately still are subjected to, although in relatively attenuated form, as a counterpoint to the more upbeat topics I've seen on the program. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I want to tell you all that some of the stuff that I am going to talk about, and some of the stuff I'm going to read, and some of the pictures I'm going to show to you, I should be track of time here. <laughs> okay. Um, are not for the squeamish. So that in academia is sometimes called a trigger warning. I prefer the term content warning. So, you know, be prepared. I'm going to speak very graphically. I think people need to speak graphically about these things. About atrocity. Okay. And, 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 I can only give you a snapshot. Here. I mean, I've been working on this stuff for like 10 years or more. And this is, this is kind of a sliver, it's a slice of the bigger picture. I mean, if you're interested in the bigger picture, at least the way I've developed it, you can visit my website. 
www.davidlivingstonsmith.com and there are plenty of links to talks and essays and so on. And there's my 2011 book, uh, Less Than Human, which also talks about this. I got two books coming out next year on the same subject. Okay, let's go, enough introduction. So, like I said, I wanted to, in fact, the only thing I'm competent to do at a conference with a theme such as this one is to look at the negative, to look at the opposite of adornment, to look at the opposite of style, and that's the, denig the historical denigration of blackness by white people, by white Americans, by many white Americans. And, and of course, this can be understood on several different levels. First level is simply the characterization of black people as ugly, repugnant, etc., which was, of course, extremely common throughout much of the history of this nation. It didn't stop slave owners from raping black women. It only went so far. But this was the ideological air that white Americans breathe. I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about two other things, which are much more extreme, which is the mutilation of black bodies, which I see as the opposite of adornment, and the conceiving of black people as subhuman creatures. And I'm going to start with this. I have this, the title up there, but normally when I show this picture, I ask the audience, does anyone recognize this picture? Does anyone know what it's about? I've only had one, one occasion. I think I showed this picture last year when I spoke at this meeting. That was the only occasion where one person recognized it. This is the first example of what's known as a spectacle lynching. Many people, many Americans, are just so poorly educated about uh, the atrocities that were committed in this country. And this is 1893, but this continued well up into the 20th century. Uh, in fact, uh, I had a guest to my class on race and racism just yesterday from uh, North Florida, and his elderly grandmother remembers when she was a little girl a very famous spectacle lynching in Marianne, Florida, the lynching of Claude Neal. So spectacle lynchings were lynchings not like their pre not like most Americans conceive of them, of you know. Half a dozen Ku Klux Klan guys ride up with their Halloween costumes on, drag some guy away, and hang him. That's a very, very cleaned up version of even small lynchings. But spectacle lynchings were widely advertised. They were public events. The, the uh, pub amenities like box saloons and, and, and stores were closed. Railroad companies laid on extra excursion trains to bring people to witness the horrors that unfolded. There were professional photographers who, took, who, made, who sold postcards depicting these unimaginably cruel and horrible events. There were even sound recordings, primitive, you know, the Edison role of the, the screams and suffering of the victim. There was with this much of there are about, there are somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people in that audience. Uh, the man on the platform is a man named Henry Smith, who is a, a mentally disabled man in Paris, Texas. This is just outside Paris, Texas. Uh, Philip and I were just talking about Texas, and how he dodged a bullet by getting a job there. <laughs> the, the picture kind of fits your, your anecdote. Um, uh, he, he was accused of murdering and raping the sheriff's four-year-old daughter. He was apprehended in Arkansas and brought back, confessed under torture, allegedly confessed, and then the spectacle began. So when I researched these things, um, I, uh, I, I go to the old newspaper reports. Uh, this is pretty graphic but it's important to get this up here so I can see better. So let me read it to you. It's from the New York Sun, the day of the lynching. His clothes were torn off piecemeal and scattered in the crowd, people catching the shreds and putting them away as mementos. 
the child's father, her brother, and two uncles then gathered about the Negro as he lay fastened to the torture platform and thrust hot irons into his qu quivering flesh. So we're on the bodily mutilation bit of my, my intro, right? It was horrible, the man dying of, by slow torture in the midst of smoke from his own burning flesh. Every groan from the fiend, every contortion of his body was cheered by the thickly packed crowd of 10,000 persons, the mass of being 600 yards in diameter, the scaffold being the center. After burning his feet and legs, the hot irons, plenty of fresh ones being at hand, were rolled up and down Smith's stomach, back, and arms. Then the eyes were burned out, and irons were thrust down his throat. I think it's very, very important to present this in this sort of detail, just because this stuff has been so whitewashed. Uh, oh, Lucius, will, will you kind of gesture to me when I'm getting dangerous near, near the end? Okay, six years later, second famous uh, uh, spectacle lynching. This time just, well, it's going to, uh, what was a town is now part of the metropolitan Atlanta lynching of Sam Hose. Sam Hose was almost certainly entirely innocent. He was accused of murdering his employer. He was a farm worker in uh, Palmetto, Georgia. Um, and he was accused of murdering his employer, raping his employer's wife. These rape charges were always thrown in because they got the white men all worked up and, uh, and harming the children. He was caught, the lynch mob were, were sort of dragging him to Palmetto, but a train pulled up and the lynch mob was scared of that these were federal troops coming in to prevent the lynching, so they lynched him in another town, Noonan, Georgia. There were thousands of people there, fresh out of Sunday services. This is Sunday, late Sunday morning, to watch the spectacle, and this is really graphic from the Springfield Republican at Springfield, Massachusetts newspaper. The clothes were torn off from the Negro in an instant. A heavy chain was produced and wound around his body. Instantly, a hand grasping a knife shot out and one of the Negro's ears dropped into a hand ready to receive it. He pleaded pitifully for mercy and begged his tormentors to let him die. His cries went unheeded. Before the torch was applied to the pyre, the Negro was deprived of his ears, fingers, and genital parts of his body. He pleaded pitifully for his life while the mutilation was going on, but stood the ordeal of fire with surprising fortitude. Now here's something to understand about these burnings. Smith was burned at the end, too. In the movies, when someone is burned to death, you know, the, 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 the kindling is set afire and the flames leap up and the person screams and dies. That's not how, it's not how it was in the Middle Ages. It's not how it was in lynching. The, the fires were constructed so, first of all, the victim would not die of asphyxiation. That's what normally happens. Say your house catches fire. You, you're not burned to death. You die of asphyxiation. The oxygen's gone. A and the, the, the fires were constructed so that the victim burns slowly to produce maximum suffering. Okay. So now let's, let's look at some of the imagery. So we finish with the bodily mutilation bit. I could say much more about that if I had an hour to speak. Let's look at the way that these uh, lynching victims, Smith and Hose, very specifically, but this is very general. You can find things like this in the literature and particularly the media of the day. Let's look at how they were described. They were described very regularly as subhuman creatures. This is the second, my third point right at the beginning, conceiving of black men. It's not exclusively black men, but I'm focusing on black men here as subhuman creatures, including monsters, as you'll see in a moment. Black Beast, the San Antonio Gazette. Bestial Negro, the St. Louis Gazette. A subhuman being in human shape. Early, early was a witness to the first lynching I described. The victim was torn asunder in the mad wantonness of gorilla ferocity. That's Haygood, that's Bishop Haygood, a Methodist bishop, who was also president of Emory University. Devoid of any human sensibilities, Vance, Vance was the father of the murdered child that prompted the first lynching. 
black brute whose carnival of blood and lust has brought death and desolation, fiendish beast. These are cited in Dre. It's a book I highly recommend about the history of American lynching. It's called um, At the Hand, what is it? At the Hands of Persons Unknown. Dre doesn't always give his sources, so I had to just say cited in Dre. But it's a good, reliable book. Okay, they were described as subhuman animals. They were also described as demons and monsters. Incarnate monster, New Orleans State. Unnatural monster, the Texarkana News. The most inhuman monster known in current history. Boy, that was a hype one, wasn't it? New York Sun. Fiend incarnate, Vance again. Monster in human form, cited in gray. So the, this, I think really this is what I want to say to you. I have a whole story about how this happens, how, how what psychological and political alchemy turns human beings, and typically the most vulnerable human beings in a population. And it's not just this, right? What you see here, we can find in so many examples of racist viciousness, of genocide and so on, the world over, the pattern repeats, the transformation of human beings into monsters. But I, w I can't do that in 15, 20 minutes. Right. So I just wanted to, perhaps this intrigues you, it disturbs you, I hope it disturbs you. It sets the stage for a lot of what goes on now. This isn't just, hi history is always in the present. And, uh, and I think it's extremely important to acknowledge and to understand. Thank you very much for listening. Tag team. <laughs> this is what niggerization looked like. It looks like. Brother PC. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Philip Lamar Cunningham. I'm coming here from Quinnipiac University. Uh, much of my research is actually on uh, popular cultures, particularly black popular cultures, so black film, um, particularly black sports um, figures. And what I decided to do is sort of take a look at Stuart Scott. Um, Stuart Scott passed away a couple of years ago, um, unfortunately, from um, cancer. Uh, but he was actually quite an important figure at ESPN. I'm not quite sure how it where one is. I mean, he had a dramatic impact, um, particularly on journalists who would follow after him. And I thought it would be wise to begin, actually, with a uh, tribute from ABC. Uh, ABC is the parent company of ESPN, and they did about a three-minute tribute video to him. Uh, that actually, I think, does a pretty good job of capturing uh, what he was all about. Also tonight, we're remembering a member of our extended family, sportscaster Stuart Scott an ESPN original whose broadcasts were as electric as the games he covered. And we're not alone. In Indianapolis today, a moment of silence. At the Bengals-Colts game, 60,000 fans and players pausing to remember. His good friend and GMA anchor Robin Roberts now with the man who could call it like no one else. Sports Center starts time time right about now. Booyah! Call Knurkle butter because he is on a roll. Derek Jeter in first, booyah! More than being in the right place at the right time, he was a new voice for a new time. Booyah. That's it. In a word, that's what he brought to sports center. From his language to his look, his personality to his passion, Stewart connected with the audience and broadened it at the same time, creating his own place in pop culture. Hey, welcome to Sports Center. I'm Stuart Scott. Booyah! I got you right. <laughs> Watching him as a black man hearing things that I talk about with my other friends and feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm part of the conversation now. He sat down with two presidents, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, and conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with some of the biggest names in sports, including Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan. Stewart's path through work and life changed in November 2007. Doctors discovered a tumor. He underwent two surgeries and months of chemotherapy and believed he'd beaten it. Four years later, in 2011, the cancer returned. Stewart faced it again, 
and again it returned in January 2013. When you say you think it's something that you'll never going to get, you don't want to know the prognosis. It doesn't really matter to you? I don't want to know how many years you think I may have left, how many months you think I may have left. Let's say it's stage four. Well, it's just going to make me scared, more scared. I don't need that. In the midst of continued chemotherapy treatments and medication regimens, Stewart took to the gym. It was good to be winded. Yeah. Having trouble breathing. Yeah. Chest hurts. You're alive. I'm alive. Home for Stewart held the greatest and most important purpose in his life and his fight, being a father. He would always talk about him because there is heart. So much pride. Instead of sending you home tomorrow, I get to go home with you tomorrow. Oh, yeah. On July 16th, 2014, after 21 years on the air, Stewart was in a different role. Not anger, but inspiration. It is my profound honor to present the 2014 Jimmy V Perseverance Award to Stuart Scott. When you die, it does not mean that you lose to cancer. You beat cancer by how you live, why you live, and in the manner in which you live. He made sports even more fun to watch. We thank Robin Roberts for that tribute to her friend, and the tribute's still coming in tonight. From LeBron James on Instagram saying, can't believe you're gone from us, I am deeply saddened. Even President Obama weighing and saying, I will miss Stuart Scott over the years, he entertained us, and in the end, he inspired us with courage and love. So one of the arguments I'm sort of making here is, is that you know we just watched a lot of praise of Stuart Scott throughout the years. Um, but it sort of belies uh, much of sort of the consternation about his appearance on ESPN. Uh, to be sure, uh, people generally loved and w um, found him to be well regarded. Uh, but that said, uh, he was a dramatically different type of anchor uh, when, comp when compared to many of his counterparts. Um, and so what I'll be looking at uh, this afternoon, I mean this morning, excuse me, is sort of um, how he evidenced black cool on ESPN and how dramatically different that was from uh, the rest of his anchors. Um, what I should also note is that you know, some of the criticisms would abound about um, other anchors later on. So particularly, for example, many of you are perhaps familiar with Jamel Hill, who recently left ESPN um, just a month or so ago to join The Atlantic after some controversy at ESPN. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but many people sort of blame people like Jamel Hill for ESPN's downturn. I don't know how much attention you all have been paying to uh, what's happening at ESPN, but over the last couple of years, ESPN has actually had um, some really bad sort of uh, you know internal fighting. So for example, they recently fired upwards of 100 people uh, last year. They let go of a lot of their talent last year as well. Um, although most of their um, black on air talent remain, many of their stalwarts, guys like John Clayton, um, so on and so forth, um, were actually dropped from um, the network. Um, and so what I will try to do today is sort of um, the following things. Um, first, we'll sort of talk about what I even mean by black cool. Um, then the secondly, what we'll do is look at sort of ESPN's evocations of black cool, particularly focusing on Stuart Scott. So uh, we'll look at his career at um, ESPN. Um, then we'll briefly sort of conclude by looking at um, journalistic and fan criticisms of black cool at ESPN because there were plenty. And then we'll sort of look at um, the current state and future of black coolness at ESPN. So one of the great things about being academic is some people will do your homework for you. Um, and one of the people who did my homework for me um, is a great scholar, um, Regina Bradley. And what she did is she sort of looked at sort of previous um, considerations of what we even mean by black cool. So uh, first she um, highlights uh, a study by Richard Bilson and Janet Majors that deals with the notion of cool pose. And she posits that cool pose basically means that um, it's a survival mechanism in the antithesis of white masculinity. Um, then we have one from Bell Hooks, a name I'm guessing many of you know. Um, she points to Bell Hooks' book, um, we, we Real Cool, which is of course named after the poem. Um, Bell Hooks presents black cool as the ways in which black men confronted the hardships of life without their spirits being ravaged. It was defined by black male willingness to confront reality, to face the truth, and bear it. 
It was defined by individual black males daring to self-define rather than be defined by others. And then, then she um, quotes Rebecca Walker, who edited uh, with um, Skip Gates a book called 1,000 Streams of Cool, Black Cool. Um, and what Walker suggests is that um, black cool should be situated um, as both a gauge and limitation to understanding a contemporary African American experience. She also goes on to suggest um, that black cool can be emulated, co-opted, appropriated, but ownership never gets denied. It's our language of survival. It's our genius. Uh, but Bradley actually gives us another way to conceive of um, cool pose, and I think it's the one that's perhaps most useful for our purposes today. Um, and what Regina Bradley writes is um, she comes up with her own theory, which is called hip hop sonic cool pose. And what she's essentially saying here in this rather verbose way is that um, hip hop sonic cool pose is very much akin to what we've already talked about. Uh, but again, with it's, a, it's sort of, a, as she notes here, a negotiation between black ma masculinity and so sonic signifiers of black manhood experiences and coolness. So things like vernacular, slang, um, an affinity for hip hop, which we will all see uh, momentarily with, or we have actually seen in um, much of Stuart Scott's expression. It is the improvisation of black masculinity through sound, making space for the performance of otherwise silence, supposed non-normative feelings and expressions. So Regina Bradley here is actually writing about hip hop. Um, but one of the things that's significant here is that most of the um, ways in which we, pro we usually conceive Stuart Scott is through the lens of hip hop because he, you know, most of the stuff he does on television uh, makes references to hip hop quite frequently. Um, but we need to distinguish two things here. Um, one, the generation of hip hop from which Stuart Scott um, emerges. So Stuart Scott, when he passed away um, a couple years ago, was almost 50 years old. Uh, which is not to suggest he's ancient, but he is from a era of hip hop that is dramatically different from the era of hip hop in which his counterparts would come later on the, um, in the ESP. And so uh, people like Jamel Hill, um, other commentators like Omani Jones um, and Michael Smith, who actually was partnered with um, Jamel Hill for a while, they're from two different types of eras of hip hop. So what we'll see is with um, Stuart Scott, his hip hop wasn't necessarily political. Uh, most of his um, hip hop usage was mostly performative, uh, relied mostly on catchphrases and the like, whereas I would argue that Jamel Hill and the like are far more political, and that's actually um, something that's presented a uh, great deal of challenge uh, to SP in, in recent years. So let's enter Stuart Scott. Um, so Stuart Scott comes to the SPN in 1993. Um, he was actually, before he, before he actually arrives there, he's a um, just a regular news commentator, uh, news anchor in Raleigh, Durham, um, North Carolina. But what he does in Raleigh that's so stunning is that apparently he gets along well with um, the sports anchors at the network. Um, again, he's noted for his catchphrase, Booyah, which he, which he utilized down there. And subsequently, he was brought to ESPN2 in 1993. Um, ESPN2 now really doesn't have much of an identity. ESPN2 actually resembles very much the regular ESPN. Um, but when ESPN2 actually originally debuted, it was just sort of this youth-oriented youth network. So they had a lot of um, youth-oriented commentators. There were people like Stuart Scott who made references to hip hop. Um, and so, you know, he got his debut there. Eventually, he got his big break on ESPN2's um, flagship show, Sports Night, uh, when his previous host, um, Keith Olbermann and Dan Patrick, actually wanted to leave ESPN2. They were really dissatisfied with the fact that they had been relegated to ESPN2. Uh, they saw that as sort of the, the end of their career. Actually, ESPN2 begins with Dan Patrick, I mean, Keith Olbermann saying, oh, this is the end of my career. I'm, I'm done. Um, but subsequently, they get bumped up to ESPN's Sports Center. And Sports Center is the flagship program for ESPN. Um, it's what everybody tunes into every um, night for you know, sports highlights and like. Um, so eventually, ESPN2 phases out their um, sort of youth movement. And so um, what happens is as they phase out their youth movement, they start moving much of their on-air talent back up to the main network, ESPN. Um, now, to be fair to ESPN, it's not, because um, I'm going to present the fact that Stuart Scott is a little bit discordant with the nature, the notion of um, ESPN commentary. But to be fair, if, you've, if anybody has watched ESPN over the years, um, what you'll notice is that they joke a lot on the network. Um, they're really informal. In fact, if you were a fan of sort of um, previous programs like ABC's Wide World of Sports with 
um, anchors like Howard Cosell and like who are really straight laced, um, straightforward um, type commentators. Uh, ESPN, the main network, might have been sort of a bit off putting to you because again, what it contained was a lot of frat, frat house humor and the like. Um, but it's key to mention that in talking about the frat house humor, that was what uh, people had grown used to, and, and in fact, they had come to expect it from ESPN. Uh, one of the thing, reasons why Stuart Scott would ultimately prove to be somewhat off-putting for viewers of ESPN is because, in fact, he was not sort of that frat house humor that they were accustomed to. Uh, the previous host of, for example, of Sports Center was someone like Craig Kilborn. Um, Craig Kilborn actually was the first host of The Daily Show um, on Comedy Central, and a lot of people forget that. And so he was sort of, again, the comedic style that was there, but um, Stuart Scott was, again, something dramatically different. Um, so different, in fact, that uh, a former VP of uh, content development there uh, said the following. I do not believe Stuart Scott was the first African American on ESPN, but he certainly was influential because on SportsCenter early, he used hip hop vernacular. He said things on the air that I knew when I heard them that the white producers who had approved it didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, so for example, when we'll take a look here in a few moments where there's a lot of uh, you know, media sort of concern about, well, what does Booyah mean? Is that like gang affiliated? Is that like gang cry? Um, so uh, he, he goes on to say, it was almost like if he's cool enough to say that on the air and no one's stopping him, uh, then the network is cool enough to watch. Now we should note that, again, uh, Stuart Scott is not the first African American on ESPN. He had been preceded by a number of important people, um, people like John Saunders, um, people like Mike Tirico. But Mike Tirico is perhaps the one person worth noting. I don't know if you guys know who Mike Tirico is, but Mike Tirico um, is a, you know, he's one of the most professional uh, sports commentators out there. He's noted for his preparedness. Um, and he was on the network before Stuart Scott. But what's interesting about Mike Tirico are, are two things. Again, one, his preparedness. So he was really formal, uh, really articulate. Um, again, very highly prepared, but he also sort of denies that he's actually African-American. Um, when questioned, for example, uh, he, he suggests, and the last name Tirico is Italian, I mean, there are a litany of, you know, essays out there, I mean, articles out there where it's sort of, he'll say things like, oh, well, you know, I was brought to um, talk to these students about being black on television. I don't know why they invited me, because I'm Italian, but hey, I came anyway. Uh, so that was the predecessor to um, Stuart Scott prior to his arrival on the ESPN. So you can imagine when Stuart Scott comes on here talking about Booyah, everyone's like, okay, well, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> um, so Stuart Scott, uh, you know, again, was very purposeful in his use of hip hop. Uh, for example, uh, you know, he's, he has many catchphrases, Booyah being among, amongst them, the title of this presentation is still as cool as the side of the other side of the pillow amongst them. Um, so what he, would say, what, what he suggested about his use of hip hop is he wanted to make sure that he was bringing the conversation he was having with his friends to ESPN. Because again, ESPN, despite having at the time a 15% um, African American audience, was primarily geared towards um, white middle class and upper class men, you know, who had disposable income. Uh, most of network television, for example, is geared after people who have money, um, and so they typically ignore audiences. And so Stuart Scott says, I wanted to represent a segment of the audience that wasn't really being represented. I just decided to take that, that being his um, style and his um, relationship with his friends and the conversations he was having with them, and translate it into what I do on SportsCenter and just add statistics. And so some of the things that he said, some of his famous catchphrases are things like, when Michael Jordan scored on a breakaway dunk, Scott might say something like, break him off a little something, Mike. Uh, we heard, for example, Booyah, Roy slow your roll kid, but he rushed it, crushed it 423 feet, just call him butter because he's on a roll. Um, and then was, uh, Kobe Bryant scored 81 points against the Toronto Raptors. Uh, Scott described his efforts as, as cool as the other side of the pillow. Um, so again, all these catchphrases, all of these references to street vernacular and like um, Scott really brought to the network with him. And he will actually prove influential on a whole host of journalists, um, particularly for example, Justin Tinsley. Uh, ESPN currently has a um, side project called The Undefeated. I don't know how familiar you all with it, but it's an excellent website. Um, looks at sports news and culture from, um, through a black lens. And what Justin Tindley said is, um, undoubtedly, Scott um, was his biggest influence. He said, Scott brought swagger and rebelliousness to sports broadcasting. 
He had more catchphrases than Ric Flair and The Rock. He came up in the same era as the cultural Bible's vibe and the source, and in the vein of those magazines, Scott helped inject the culture, the cockiness and confidence we loved and cherished into mainstream culture. Uh, but again, it's not as if those things went uncriticized. Um, Again, Stuart Scott very early on, because his sound was um, so unique, uh, received a great deal of criticism. So, so for example, as shortly after he gets called up to the main Sports Center show, he gets tons and tons of hate mail, um, um, an unbridled amount of hate mail, just for being, uh, you know, bringing hip hop to um, that, you know, demographic. And again, a key aspect of this, one of the things I know that I saw in my research on this is that. Uh, before this, um, ESP, before he gets called up to ESPN, ESPN gets the um, rights, broadcasting rights to the Ryder Cup. The Ryder Cup is um, a sailing competition, and so you can tell by what uh, demographic they were seeking to cater to. Um, and so there was a lot of consternation about the fact that, hey, while we're out here trying to get these fancy sporting events, right, we just brought the blackest dude on television uh, to the network. Um, and so he received a lot of hate mail for it. Um, and what we find also is that typically uh, dissatisfaction with sort of the hip hop vibe of ESPN comes when there's sort of some dissension with hip hop in general in the broader community. So for example, um, in 2004, as uh, Stuart Scott is progressing along, uh, there's a lot of tension in the air surrounding hip hop and sports in general. So um, I'm not sure how much you guys remember about 2004 sports. Uh, it was a pretty bad year in terms of um, hip hop being blamed for virtually all of society's ills. Uh, so for example, in 2004, uh, there was the brawl at the Palace of Auburn Hills between the Indiana Pacers and the Detroit Pistons. And what ended up happening is one of the Indiana Pacers players, Ron Artest, gets hit by a, a flying object from the fans. And subsequently, Ron Artest charges into the stands. He actually beats up uh, uh, one of the fans the wrong fan, mind you, but the fan who was talking to him the wrong way, and it just goes wrong. And so hip hop got blamed for that, right? Because what they were sort of suggested is, well, hey, if these hip hop thugs uh, in, in the NFL and NBA, NBA, you know, just straight up and fly right, uh, we wouldn't have all these problems. And ESPN responded in kind of many ways. So, for example, um, during this time, ESPN actually hires Rush Limbaugh, of all people, to do sports commentary. Now, it's actually very short-lived. I don't know how much you guys remember about uh, Rush Limbaugh's turn on, on ESPN, but it ended very quickly because what he essentially said is, it went, I mean, he couldn't go but so long without bringing out the uh, full racism. So one of the things that he sort of suggested when, uh, one Sunday after morning, uh, okay, is that um, basically that uh, quarterback, um, um, Don Van McNabb from the Eagles basically was just lucky and wasn't really that good. Um, really quickly then, to get out of this, um, so there was a lot of dissatisfaction with Stuart Scott's um, you know, commentary, uh, again, really tied to hip hop, and then subsequently, uh, the people who followed after him bore the bear of what happened to him. So we see this happen with Jamel Hill and Michael um, Smith, who subsequently had taken over, or had taken over, uh, sports center con commentary duties a couple of years ago. Uh, they were not ready for Jamel Hill, and we'll sort of see why in a moment. So Jamel Hill and um, her partner Michael Smith had hosted a show called His and Hers on ESPN2 for several years. They had very good chemistry. They brought a lot of pop culture references to um, the network, uh, black pop popular culture references to the network. So again, um, you know, they basically altered the, the um, main flagship program so much so that, again, people were furious in many regards. And one of the downsides, of course, is that uh, the ratings actually tanked. Um, it doesn't help, unfortunately, that Jamel Hill was the firestorm of controversy. Uh, Jamel Hill, for example, um, had gotten in trouble previously for, you know, uh, basically saying this about Boston. I thought I'd bring that to the fore. Uh, what she says about Boston is that basically uh, her rooting for a Boston team is like Hitler, uh, like rooting for Hitler, uh, because she's from Detroit. And so she was trying to make a point about sort of Boston's racist history, but there's the, that. Uh, but where she really gets into trouble um, is right during the end of her tenure. She gets in trouble for basically suggesting, as noted here, that our president, president is a white supremacist. Um, zero last word. Um, but then she, so she also, uh, actually gets removed from the um, network uh, for um, these comments. And so we are at a point, just to finish, um, where Black <laughs> Pool is actually kind of in trouble at ESPN at the moment. 
Uh, most of the anchors um, who were evidencing Black Cool are gone. Stuart Scott, of course, has passed away. Jamel Hill has been released from her contract. Um, her partner, Michael Smith, still technically works for ESPN, but he appears rather sporadically. Um, other shows have been canceled. So right now, one of the only sort of um, Black Cool, uh, I'll say, uh, commentators, we can talk a little bit about this during Q&A, um, remaining is Bomani Jones, um, who is a bit of a firebrand himself. Um, and his show originally uh, just debuted in August. It was an hour long. Then just a couple weeks ago, it got reduced to a half hour and then moved to 4.30, even though it's called, I mean, the 4 o'clock, even though it's called high noon. So the prognosis actually looks pretty bad for Black Cool on ESPN, although we will say, what I'll conclude by saying is, is that um, it always has. And in many regards, Black Cool is cool as long as there are no problems in the broader society. Uh, of course, we cannot divorce uh, Black Cool from current concerns uh, about uh, hip hop and the like in our contemporary climate. So I will stop there. Amen. Church say amen. Amen. Can the synagogue say amen? What about the mosque? I mean, all right. Dennis has the mic. We're open now for questions and commentaries. Please direct them to either to either one of our speakers or if they're open, they will join. And if you have questions or comments for each other, then please uh, let's have that engagement as well. We've got about just over roughly half an hour. Please. I know please, you. Let me just ask, since we know who they are, please let us know who you are. Oh, okay. I'm Lee Roberts, and I have to admit quite a bit about my stupidity, because I have no idea what the difference is between hip-hop and rap. I, can you hear me? Oh, that's better. Sorry. So there's, there's no universal agreement about sort of uh, this person. Can you hear me? OK, so there's very little actual agreement about sort of um, <coughs> Um, there's very little agreement about the distinguishment between them. Two, for, for some people, um, I would say the general um, way to view it is that um, hip hop is the culture and rap is the music. So rap is the performance aspect of hip hop. Um, I think that's perhaps the easiest way to sort of think of it. Um, now, when we talk about them as genres, um, hip hop now uh, has come to encompass even like R and B. Uh, but generally speaking, hip hop is the culture built around sort of five pillars, graffiti, breakdancing, um, b-boying, DJing, and um, rapping. Um, and, and rap is the music. So I don't know if that clarifies it. Rap is almost like um, poetry, isn't it? I mean, we saw a whole thing in New York and that was rap, and it was great. It was, um, it was interesting, it was well done. So, so rap was born out of a whole bunch of, it has a, a number of different sort of um, ancestors. So for example, um, there's the toasts from, uh, you know, the boast of like early um, black vernacular, for example. Uh, we hear it in spoken, things like spoken words. So for example, there's a lot of um, debate about what constitutes the very first rap album. Some will point to, for example, the last poets um, spoken word album from the 1960s is one of the first rap albums, as opposed to something like um, the Fatback <laughs> Band's album, which is supposedly also the first rap album. So there's, again, there's no universal agreement about what constitutes rap, but it does have a whole bunch of different ancestors. Um, so that Thank you. And the old man just throwing a little bit of history, but it's interesting for an older generation, for some of us, one of the earliest rappers for some of us was Barry White. Uh, now, because for some of us, the rap was the talk that you had as a male that would be enticing to and seductive of women. 
do you have a rep? Could you talk her out of her? <laughs> oh, older sister, wait. Did, do you have this really cool persuade, this, this speech as a cool brother that would be persuasively seductive? That was called having a rep. And one of the persons who really exemplified that for many of our generation was Barry White, because you listen to a lot of the Barry White music, he wasn't always singing, he was always talking through over the orchestration, talking through his own. And Barry White was an exemplary rapist that has had the rap for my generation before we got the version of coming that we now call hip hop culture. So, I mean, so the last poets, for example, you can say that their first album is even before Barry White actually comes to the, you know, the chorus. So, for example, I believe the last poets album, uh, they largely seen as the precursor to um, contemporary rap is from like 1968. Um, and then of course you could also point to these sort of artists like James Brown, who you know, if, if he's not rapping, then I don't know who is, right? Um, and so, I mean, there are a myriad of, you know, um, examples. Yeah, but okay, here's a point I wanna make. That there was this particular mode of speaking that was called having a rap. That is, there was this performance thing that had to do with this cool, persuasive speech. Do you, it was like, do you have a line that is persuasive? Do you have a rap? And that's what it was called, having a rap. Next question, I said that was a hand. Hi. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Dekina. I'm a graduate student in Louisiana State University. I have a professor, uh, question for Professor Louisiana Smith, and then I have a second question linked to that. So um, Louisiana is um, it's a southern state, and we have a lot of trauma that's Still not digested. I'll tell you. And I sit in the classroom. I, I teach French, but I also teach French literature, and I have uh, diverse classrooms. Where, as a white person of Russian origin, I'm Russian. I have to speak of certain things, and Francophone literature is very brutal. Some of the images that you show, I'm familiar with those images, and I'm familiar with the sort of narrative that comes with the images. So I would like to know. My first question is, what is your experience? And you, we're talking about content um, trigger, sorry, content warnings versus trigger warnings. So what's the experience of the response of the students in New England? Um, like in general, how do you approach teaching that in the classroom? That's my first question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think it's a really important question. So the, now I teach philosophy. If you pardon my, pardon my French, <laughs> most philosophy is bullshit. <laughs> uh, it's, it's as useless and as useful as running on a treadmill. You know, you run, you run, you don't get anywhere. But you do develop the capacity to run, so it's training and thinking. But I'm primarily interested in addressing real things, uh, unlike many of my colleagues. And the, the course I teach, which I think is the most valuable thing that I teach by far, is a course called Race, Racism, and Beyond. And I've spent years figuring out how to teach that. I teach in Maine. Almost all my students are white. Right? There'll be one or two students of color in the class. Um, and uh, what I do, I think, really works. So I start the semester with the assumption, which is, all, which is virtually always proven to be correct, that the students are ignorant of, of the history of race and racism. They have the cartoon version. The cartoon version, and I focus, you know, of course race is a really big issue. I focus on black and white, and a little bit on the Holocaust. But I focus on black and white. Uh, and they get the cartoon version, which is there was slavery, and then there was something called Jim Crow, which they don't quite know what it is. And then there was Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and everyone lived happily ever after, right? And so that needs to be changed. So I spend literally the first two or three weeks of the course showing them films, 
because saying things and reading things is different uh, from seeing them. I've shown them documentary films in historical sequence. So starting with, there's a great BBC series called Racism and History, which begins like in the 16th century, and I conclude with uh, has to be two classes, the recent film 13th. That gives them that historical sweep, and that just blows their minds. And what it does is makes them realize that this is something we really need to know about. The feedback I get from students, um, more than anything else at the end of, of the class is, I'm so angry I never learned about this. My whole education, I hadn't just strayed in this philosophy class, probably because it just happened to fit into my schedule or seemed like the least boring thing I offer, I wouldn't have known about this. So once we get there, then they're motivated. And then the next part of the course is, is about what we philosophers call the metaphysics of race. Now what that means is a set of questions like, is race real or is it a fiction? If it's real, what kind of thing is it? That gives them the tools to think about it because people just don't know how to think about it. So the first part gives the motivation, the second part gives the tools, and then the next part of the course, we do theories of racism. What is racism? There are different conceptions of what racism is. And we just say racism. I mean, I wrote an article saying we should actually get rid of the word because it doesn't say anything anymore. I think people should be really explicit are you saying that you think black people are less than human? Then God damn it, say it. Don't use this word that people can deny. It. I don't hate black people, I'm not a racist, right? Um, and then the final part of the course is the beyond bit, where we're looking at, at the psychology of racial thinking and a bunch of other issues like uh, reparations, redlining, stuff like that. That sequence really works, the sequence is really important. And I'll tell you one of the really, really important things in that first part of the course with the films, that they don't watch them on their own. It has to be a group experience in the class. It's, it's psychologically makes a big, big difference. So that's, that's my take on it. And my students, by the middle of the course, my white students are perfectly comfortable talking about white supremacism. Or if I start, if I did it in a different way or I started with that, their backs would all be up. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Well, I, have a, I have a second question that I was hoping that Dr. Outlaw would contribute to as well. So then, uh, once we have all of this knowledge and we see the representation, then how do we talk about this? And this has to do with the beginning of your speech yesterday of saying negra and saying negro and saying nigger. And I have students who think everybody's African American. I, I apologize sincerely to everybody who's from Africa and from the Caribbean here. I have students in Louisiana who say African American because saying black is bad, and they said that MSSN was African American. Or once we talked, we read a story of Urika, who was a slave woman from Senegal, and one student said, Elle est Afro Americana, and I almost fainted. I was not ready for that. And me, as an educator in the beginning of my career, I'm taught how to analyze, I'm taught how to represent, I'm taught how to do the pedagogics, how to engage. I'm not taught how to talk to a diverse or not diverse any student about race. And as a person who is an outsider in the country, it's even more difficult for me. I was not brought up in this, but I feel as an outsider, I also can participate in that. So I was wondering, how do you approach that in classroom? How do you allow students, what do you say to them? So what, how do you do that? Yeah, very thank you. It's a very, very challenging question. I'm gonna take a while to work through this. Um, you know, David has just given uh, an example of how he works through this. Um, and let me just say, I think part of uh, David had been born and raised in the U.S., has yeah. done decades of work in the subject. David has a conception of himself as male, white, U.S. American, et cetera, et cetera. So he has worked through an awful lot to come to this in certain kinds of ways because he's also been socialized in the U.S. in various kinds of ways. And as you noted, you haven't, right? And all, very few of us get actually educated to do this kind of work because most of the disciplines 
have been structured around lies. Most of the disciplines have been structured around lies designed to perpetuate the socialists of sex and generations in this country to preserve white supremacy. And we get these periods of disruption against that. What became contemporary black studies, African American studies, African, African, African studies was a disruptive set of moves to contend with these constructions going on in disciplinary formations that were deforming of the people who participated in them and also about other subjects, subject, subjugated peoples in the world. So your situation is particularly understandable and part of what you are compelled to have to do is what a lot of us of my generation going through graduate school learned that we have to do. It was called double duty work. That double duty work was you had to establish math and demonstrate mastery in the discipline. I have a PhD in philosophy. From my undergraduate years at Fisk University all the way through the PhD studies in graduate school at Boston College, I never, ever was assigned a text written by a person of African descent. Ever. Ever. I never had a professor in philosophy who was a person of African descent. So coming up in the black power generation, I had to figure out how to become determined with this black consciousness stuff and begin to talk about black people and bring that into the university, blah, 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 blah. All of that work had to be done outside of the context of my formal studies. So I've got formal studies within which I've got to establish and demonstrate competency I've got these passionate commitments that I'm trying to pursue, but I've got to do that on top of everything else that I've done. That was what we call the double duty work. That you've got to find some co-conspirators, you've got to find some help, find a community of persons, you've got to find those other readings and things that you've got to immerse yourself into, fueled by this passion, while you've got to stave off, protect your soul from the defamation that's going on professionally, while you build up another sense of yourself through these other studies that you're doing, gaining competencies in reading other kinds of things, talking to other kinds of people, forging networks through which you can gradually begin to build up and bring into your own research and to your own teaching. And the other thing that you have to really learn to do, you know, you heard David just say, and he didn't go into this, but it's certainly there in what he indicated to us. Working this out as a pedagogue is really across time. Teaching is in always, in some ways, experimental. I do not know, I don't care how long I've taught a particular subject, I do not know when I walk into a new classroom with a new body of students, how that is going to go. I have no idea how it is going to go. I may have taught it 20 times over 30 or 40 years. I do not know how it's going to go with a new body of students. I've got to run the experiment anew every last bit time. Now, if you're, a if you're a teacher who has a fixed syllabus and your objective as a pedagogue is to drive your students from the beginning to the end of that syllabus, keeping strictly with that syllabus, and the timetable built into that syllabus, you can do that. You can certainly do it. Now, I know, I know colleagues who do that all the time. Everything is strictly in accord with the syllabus that you've worked out in advance, you put in a timetable, and you just drive to that syllabus all the way across. What does that have to do with the learning of your students? What does that have to do with the pace of your students' learning? What does it have to do with the complexities of what's happening in that class or seminar room as they're engaging with you and with, with one another and the pace of their learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're driving from the syllabus. You gotta get to the end and cover everything that's on that syllabus. What does it have to do with the pace of their learning? So for me, the syllabus is a point of departure, but I'm not driving to the end of that syllabus in that way. I'm always trying to be responsive to where are my students? I'm always having to stop and ask them, okay, where are we? Is this working? 
do we need to shift gears? What do you recommend that we do? Tell me how you would like to work at this differently. I have this going on right now with a group of graduate students. Three of them, we meet in my office. So I'm saying, okay, tell me how you want to approach this. I mean, this is where they come up on a, we're reading Invisible Man. Nelson has a character that's saying, call it people niggas. None of my graduate students will say that. And he said, well, you know, Ellison uses the N-word. I said, excuse me. <laughs> where in the text does Ellison write N-word? <laughs> Nowhere. So I, I keep forcing them to have to say nigga. Then I have to talk them through why this is so important. So again, the long, short response is, as an educator, you don't have to go through the process of re-educating yourself to do this work within the context in which you find yourself hopefully becoming acutely mindful of your students and therefore how is it do you need to recalibrate continuously who you are and what you're about in the context of your students while working to establish a framework in that class seminar room within which they can take the risks of exposing themselves such that they can grow. That they can find that room to be a space in which they can be open to risk that will be fermenting of their growth. And that you stay open and understand that as I've come to learn I don't know when my students are really going to get what I'm up to. That getting it has virtually nothing to do with the conventional structuring of the formal learning situation called a semester or a quarter. We've got a start, we've got an end. We've got an academic calendar. Actual learning and growth is not in keeping with that academic calendar. They may get it now. I literally every month or so I get an email from students that I taught 20, 30 years ago. Writing to me saying, in effect, I understand now I want to thank you. I'm having nothing like after eight different colleges and universities, what student was thinking of <laughs> telling you what school? But okay, I, I, I don't know when they're going to get it. They don't know when they're going to get it. They don't know what part of what you're trying to do that they're going to get. It is likely to happen. But you are never likely to know whether it happens, when it happens. And I'll close by saying this. What I came to understand about teaching really was when my first son was born. And I began to understand the responsibilities of being a parent. And that as a parent, you will do all kinds of things on behalf of your child, knowing if you get your most fervent wish, you will die before your child. I have never met a parent who says, I hope my child dies before me. You would do all kinds of things in behalf of your child such that they would have a certain kind of life. But if you get your most fervent wish, you would not live to see how it all turns out. So you don't do this for your child on the condition you get to witness the fulfillment of it. No, you do it. And if you get your wish, you'll die before them, but it would go on. And what is that called? Love. That's what love became for me as a parent. Doing for my child with the fervent wish that I will die before I see how it all turns out. That led me to reinterpret what it meant to be a teacher. That for me, 
teaching is the practice of loving. That I will do for my students my very best knowing I am unlikely to ever know how it turns out. And yet I must keep faith with my students. Can I just uh, pray very quick, very quick. My educational philosophy is pretty indistinguishable from, from yours, and it's too darn bad that universities make it so difficult for us to educate yeah. people. And one very quick thing, a, a simple uh, thing you can do, which is my students just love, it's very important to me. I have, during the course of the semester, lots of black scholars visit. Now, we don't have money to Maybe I can bring one person in the flesh, but there's this wonderful thing called Skype. And I have black philosophers Skyping in all the time. We have conversations, students read their stuff, and it, it really, really is important to them. That's a question over here. Oh, Dennis, you have, okay, please. Would you, yeah, that is who you are. Hi, my name is India. Um, I can't help but link your two presentations. So I like to think of like the 90s and the growth of like the sitcom Martin and living and living color, living single, all these things and tying it to how it has trickled out due to like O.J. Simpson and like how mutilation of black bodies is tied to how the pop culture is changing the way that they present us. So can you speak to how maybe this ESPN stuff is reflective of Black Lives Matter and this mutilation of black bodies that we're just researching? So what I was suggesting is that one of the reasons why ESPN is currently experiencing a bit of a downturn in its fortunes is primarily because of that connection, right? So for example, um, much of the animosity towards Jamel Hill is because she is outspoken, right? Because she said things like, um, our president is a racist, right? She's spoken in favor of Black Lives Matter. And many people sort of have seen um, ESPN as this sort of leftist network. Um, as a result, and so because her, um, because during their program, so it's, it's called SC6 when it was on uh, Sports Center at six, um, there would be a lot of um, insider conversations with sports stars about sort of how they felt about things like Black Lives Matter, um, how they felt about sort of police brutality in general, and the like, particularly because they would ex be the ones who are apt to experience it. And again, I think part of the um, the problem for many of ESPN's viewers are, of course, you have those who just are um, and not actually want to hear things politically inclined anyway. They don't, people don't like their sports and politics to intermingle, even though everything is political. Um, but then the other side of that coin, I would suggest, is that, um, again, because they have a lot of, um, I'll say critics, who sort of suggest that one of the problems with ESPN is that it's leftist, um, and is concerned with these things, um, that ultimately people are breaking away from it. And what they're doing is actually ignoring some other real life industry things that are happening, right? People are just not subscribing to cable anymore. Uh, people are debundling. And so what they've been able to, um, their opponents, particularly there's one guy named Clay Travis who works for Fox Sports. Um, he's been able to really do is change the conversation around sort of Jamel Hill and the like to so not being about, you know, whether or not she's correct or whether or not she's actually accurate, right? But more about sort of, well, is this network trying to indoctrinate you? Um, so, I, yeah, I absolutely think that that's where you can see the connection between sort of how far pop culture can go, how far black cool can go. Um, as long as it's not political, it's fine. Um, and as long as our climate is fine, it's fine. But yeah. the minute those things change, I don't think I have anything to add. So, don't know enough about this stuff. Wait, tell us who you are. I'm Dorothy Clark. And I wanted to say something about, is this on? Can you hear yeah. okay. Speak loud, yeah. I wanted to say something about the newspaper accounts of the lynchings. There was something about this that struck me. As a journalist and a historian, I appreciate the fact that we have these as source material to go back and do research and take account of these things. But what struck me was these accounts could be flipped over and used to define the behavior of the perpetrators and the spectators at the
Yeah, they could, and they very readily are. And I think that would be an error, actually, mm -hmm. because um, sadly, these are all human beings. And it's very, very tempting to, to, do, to dehumanize the dehumanizers, to say they're monsters, they're beasts. They're, not, they're, not, they're all human beings, and that's our problem. We need to understand what it is about human beings, what it is about their psychology, what it is about their political act, their interactions, what it, what it is about the, the social forces at work which produce these grotesque phenomena again and again and again and again. But I think you're absolutely right, and, and people do make that move. I have one. Please, yeah. Please, yeah. Please, yeah. Today. Um, lynching has not gone far. I don't know if you are familiar. This is in today's headlines. In Arkansas and Missouri, there is a radio campaign, oddly, by the black Americans for the president's agenda. Okay, that's scary enough right there. But um, they feature a radio ad that, with a woman saying, if white Democrats win, we'll be lynching black folk again. So um, the Republicans have said we don't want it. The Democrats have said we don't want it. The Arkansas Civil Liberties have filed a suit against it, but it's still airing in some places, dropping a lynching. But it's not far. It is not, as you said, today is tomorrow's history. So we're living this historical moment right now where lynching is on the radio. Okay? And then secondly, to um, Dr. Outlaw, I'm sorry if you heard me laughing when you said this syllabus. I create a syllabus for the game, for the administration. There you go, this is my syllabus. And then I give a kids, a student, one sheet that says this is the real syllabus. There aren't any dates, these are the dates. You don't have to come on this day, you don't have to come on this day, but you have to come on these days. And you said when you walk into the new semester, you don't know how it's gonna go. I walk in every day and I don't know how to go. I know, you know, I got a couple of points that I need to make, but how I make them, it really is, every day is a work in progress with the teacher. That's true, that's what I'm at. So, um, I just, um, oh, and <clears throat> the other comment uh, with the radio lynching ad, um, the role, here, the lynching assumes the role, but it's really been replaced by bullets and bars. We're still doing the same thing. Thank you. We have about five minutes on the comments. Are, at least because the two of you have questions for our comments regarding each other, please be open for that. I'm just grateful to learn, have learned so much about, because I know nothing about sports the whole world. I just, I don't get it. It's like someone who's colorblind. And I've learned a lot of stuff. And in particular, I can explain to my spouse the origin of the term she likes to use when a student gets something and she says, Booyah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions or comments? Um, well, please. Philip, um, I don't do sports either. I like you. Yeah. But I knew everyone you were talking about. I knew Stuart Scott. And I'm trying to figure out, how did I know? How do I know these things? <coughs> Perhaps because these were people of color, uh, Jamel Hill and all, and she's, of course, far more recent. Um, but I'm aware, and perhaps because they were people of color who were in the media so somehow I figured out who they were or listened whenever they made an appearance. So I, 
I knew what you were talking That's really surprising. <laughs> <laughs> there is a commonality between the two of them, which is that they are people who, um, at their respective times, were not really sort of expected to be in the spheres in which they were. So you have, for example, um, Stuart Scott, who again is bringing this hip hop style to a network that had largely never incorporated to begin with. And then you have Jamel Hill, who, of course, you know, we, if we don't like politics in sports to mix, we really don't like women in sports to mix in our, well, in our culture. And, 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 I, and I say that not to suggest that I don't, but just, I mean, a lot of people have a problem with Jamel Hill primarily because of two things. One, her personal politics, and then B, because of her willingness to fight back. Um, so because of that, she's become quite infamous, and that's probably most likely why you know her. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to see now that um, one of the best things about um, her being released from ESPN is now she the filter's off. And so um, I think now we're really going to get to the level that we deserve. Yeah. Well, he'll unchange. Please join me in thanking our two presenters. Thank you.